Hi folks, it's Professor Davis again. This time here to explain to you the basics of stereoisomers. I'm going to begin by pointing out to you that tetrahedral molecules, which have four distinct substituents, have something we call chirality in chemistry, which is really just a fancy word for handedness. And this is because there are two different arrangements of substituents which are possible around a tetrahedral center. Taking our examples here with our uh, fictitious molecule containing a yellow, green, blue, and red substituent around a gray central atom, you can see that I have two different arrangements here which are distinct. They cannot be superimposed with one another even though they have all the same bond connectivity. When this happens, we call these two compounds stereoisomers of one another. Keeping in mind that stereoisomerism is a relationship between two molecules. When a compound has this sort of property, uh, both of the stereoisomers should lack any symmetry elements whatsoever within themselves. This is to say that there are no mirror planes or inversion centers within the molecules. And this gives them a property known as optical activity, or the ability to rotate plane polarized light. We'll talk more about this in a, another um, installment. Now let's take a closer look at the simple enantiomer that we uh, showed in the previous slide. And that would be a gray central atom with tetrahedrally arranged substituents around it colored in yellow, blue, green, and red. If I reflect this molecule through a mirror plane, I obtain the molecule on the right side of the screen. And what may not be readily apparent at the moment is that these two molecules are not superimposable with one another. So to make that clear, let's attempt to do so. When I attempt to overlap my molecules as they were oriented after the reflection, you'll notice that the blue and green substituents do not overlap with one another. If these were truly the same molecule, I should be able to rotate and translate one or both of these molecules and get them ultimately to overlap perfectly. But my best efforts to do so, for example, rotating to get the greens to overlap, only leads to another problem where now the red and the blue do not overlap. So under no set of rotations and translations can I make these two molecules overlap, which means that they are distinct chemical entities. And so we need to recognize that each of these potential arrangements is a different kind of molecule. When this happens, when we have a mirror image which is not superimposable, we refer to these stereoisomers as enantiomers. Enantiomers need not have only one chiral center. It's possible to have an enantiomer with many chiral centers, as in this example, where we have one that has two chiral atoms, both shown in gray. The first having a blue, yellow, and green substituent, and the second having an orange, teal, and magenta substituent. If I take a copy of this molecule and invert both of these chiral centers by exchanging the blue and green and exchanging the orange and teal substituents, I've created a compound which is a mirror image. You'll notice that in this case they do not overlap with one another. And if I simply turn my molecule, I can make it align in such a way that it is a reflection of the original. Because these are non-superimposable mirror images, we call these enantiomers. And you notice that in both examples, uh, with the, the simple single uh, chiral centered molecule and one with more than one chiral center, in order to create the enantiomer, I had to invert all of the chiral centers within the compound. So as long as this takes place, a wholesale inversion of all the chiral atoms in the molecule, we have a enantiomer. Another type of stereoisomer which you're likely to hear about in your chemistry course is diastereomers. Diastereomers are defined as non-superimposable, non-mirror images which have all the same bond connectivity. In order for this to occur, there must be at least two chiral centers within the molecule. So let's take a look at a fictitious molecule, which is the simplest example 
of a set of diastereomers. Here again is our molecule with two chiral centers shown in gray, one with blue, green, and yellow substituents, and one with orange, teal, and magenta substituents. Let's duplicate this molecule, but this time, instead of inverting both chiral centers, I'm only going to invert one chiral center, the one on the left. Notice now that the blue and green substituents have been interchanged, but that the chiral center on the right side of the molecule is unchanged. At this point, if I attempt to rotate my molecule in such a way as to make it a mirror image, notice that no matter what I do, I'm unable to do so. The chiral center I've inverted is in fact a reflection, but the unchanged chiral center does not overlap. Even if I attempt to recover this by rotating about the central bond of this molecule, I can't get these two molecules to be a reflection of one another. Aligning the teal atoms causes the orange to be knocked out. So let's return this molecule to its original alignment. Notice that I can't overlap these compounds either. That inversion of the left-handed uh, chiral center in this molecule knocks the blue and green atoms out of alignment. And that no matter what I do to rotate or translate this molecule, I can't get all of these atoms to realign. Rotating the central bond to align the green atoms causes the yellow to now be out, as well as the blue. So by inverting some, but not all, of the chiral centers within this molecule, I have created a set of diastereomers, or non-superimposable non-mirror images. A third type of stereoisomer, which you're likely to encounter in your chemistry course, is a meso compound, which is not actually a set of stereoisomers, but the exact same compound. Let me demonstrate what I mean by that. We have here a compound which contains two chiral centers, which in this case are equal but opposite in handedness. Notice that our two chiral centers each contain a blue, green, and yellow substituent, and as a fourth substituent, the other chiral center. Because these are equal in the sense that they have the same four substituents, but opposite in their handedness, they create a mirror plane within the center of the compound. So if I were to take this compound with my two equal and opposite stereocenters, duplicate it, and then invert each stereocenter by exchanging, let's say, the blue and green atoms, I've actually affected no change whatsoever on the molecule. This may not be readily apparent from the orientations that they're currently in, but if I rotate my molecule on the right, we can make it very obvious that nothing at all has changed here. They're superimposable with one another and therefore are exactly the same compound. This is the consequence of a mirror plane which runs through the center. So a meso compound is actually its own reflection. And what distinguishes them from other achiral molecules is that they actually contain chiral centers but do not rotate plane polarized light. Now let's summarize what we've covered so far with respect to the three major types of uh, chiral center containing compounds. I have here a table with two axes, one of which is superimposability and one of which is whether or not the two compounds are a reflection of one another. Let's start with the first set of conditions, non-superimposable mirror images. When this is the case, we refer to these two compounds as enantiomers of one another. Enantiomers are characterized by having all of the stereocenters inverted from one to the other. When this occurs, as in our example containing our two chiral centers, which we both inverted, we have a set of distinct molecules which are a reflection of one another. Notice that there are no symmetry elements within either of these two molecules, that is to say no mirror planes or inversion centers. And because of this, we expect that when we work with them in their enantiopure states, they will be optically active and rotate plane polarized light. 
In our second set of conditions, we're dealing with superimposable mirror images. When this is the case with a compound containing chiral centers, we're dealing with a meso compound. Meso compounds are characterized by having equal and opposite stereocenters within the molecule. When this is the case, reflecting the molecule creates an exact copy. And so a meso compound is not really a set of molecules, but rather a single molecule. Because this molecule has a mirror plane, we do not expect it to be optically active. In our third set of conditions, we have non-superimposable, non-mirror images. When this occurs, we call these molecules diastereomers of one another. Diastereomers are characterized by having some, but not all, of their stereocenters inverted. In the example that we looked at today, we had a compound with two chiral centers, only the one on the left of which was inverted. When this is the case, they can't be superimposed, nor are they actually a reflection of one another. Notice that there are no symmetry elements within these molecules, no mirror planes or inversion centers, and so we expect them to be optically active. In the case of compounds having chiral centers, if they're superimposable, but not reflections, they're the exact same compound. This means that they're going to have identical stereocenters, and therefore they'll be the uh, exact same compound. And I've just shown you our example here from what we've been looking at today, which would be one with two chiral centers that are distinct from one another. But notice that I have affected no change at all. The molecules are exactly the same. We expect this compound to be optically active because it does not have any type of uh, symmetry elements inside of it. So this is a summary of the three major types of stereoisomers of one another, how to identify them and what some of their characteristics will be. In a future installment, we'll take a look at some specific organic compounds which have these properties to give you a better feel of the context of how we work with stereoisomers in organic chemistry. But that's all for now, so we'll see you the next time.